We'll thank you for your patience and your forbearance. Uh, the subcommittee will now receive testimony from the first panel before us today. Uh, I'd like to introduce them across the board before we get started, and then we'll go to the five minutes uh, for each. Uh, Dr. Peter W. Singer is a senior fellow and director of the 21st Century Defense Initiative at the Brookings Institution. His work there focuses on the future of war, current U.S. defense needs, and the future of the United States defense system. Dr. Singer has published several books and articles, including most recently, Wired for War, the Robotics Revolution, and Conflict in the 21st Century. And I know it's not exactly getting a, a recommendation from Oprah, uh, but I've read it <laughs> in the process of reading it, and it is a good read and well worth doing. He was recently named by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the top 100 global thinkers of 2009. Dr. Singer received a BA from the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University and a PhD from Harvard University. Dr. Edward Barrett is the Director of Research at the United States Naval Academy's Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership and a professor in the Department of Leadership, Ethics, and Law. He joined the Naval Academy in 2006 after returning from active duty in Iraq and Afghanistan. He currently serves in the United States Air Force Reserves. Dr. Barrett holds a BS from the University of Notre Dame and a PhD from the University of Chicago. Mr. Kenneth Anderson is a professor at the Washington College of Law at American University and a research fellow, fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's an authority on international human rights, war, armed conflict, and terrorism. Mr. Anderson has previously served on the Board of Directors of America's Watch, the precursor to Human Rights Watch, and is the founder and former director of the Human Rights Watch Arms Division. He holds a BA from UCLA and a JD from Harvard University. Mr. John Jackson is a professor of unmanned systems at the U.S. Naval War College, where he is currently teaching a self-designed course entitled Case Studies in Technology and Warfare, Unmanned Systems. Mr. Jackson served for 27 years in the United States Navy as a supply and logistics specialist before retiring at the rank of captain. An award-winning author, he has extensively studied history and operational uses of modern aircraft. He holds degrees from Providence College and Salve Regina University, where he is currently a PhD candidate. And Mr. Michael Fagan is the chair of the Unmanned Systems Ad Advocacy Committee for the Association for Unmanned Vehicles Systems International. He served for 26 years in, in the United States Marine Corps, including time as a requirements officer for unmanned aircraft, before retiring as a colonel and chief of staff of the Defense Airborne Reconnaissance Office. He currently serves as the Chief Operating Officer of Logos Technology. He holds a BS from Indiana University and an MS from the University of Southern California. And again, I want to thank all of you, wit the witnesses, for making themselves available today and sharing with us their expertise. It's the policy of this committee to swear in the witnesses before they testify. I ask all of you to please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will please acknowledge that all of the witness answers in the affirmative. As I think you already know, all of your written testimony will be entered in the record by unanimous consent. Uh, we like to allocate five minutes, if we can, for people to generalize their testimony so we can get to the question and answer period. The, light, the green light will be on when there's one minute remaining. Uh, the amber light will go on, and when the five minutes is up, the red light will go on, uh, at which point we'd like you to try to wind down if you're not already at that point so we can move to the other witnesses and then questions. Dr. Singer, we'll start with you, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. It's an honor to be part of this important discussion on an issue that is not only crucial to national security, but often crucially misunderstood. As background, I work at the Brookings Institution where I lead our research and analysis on 21st century defense issues. Several years ago, I began to be quite interested in the issues of the greater use of robotics in our human wars. And so I set out on a journey to interview the variety of actors in this world, everything from the scientists who are building these machines to the science fiction authors who advise the military to those in the military, everything from the 19-year-old operators who are controlling machines 7,000 miles away, all the way up to the four-star generals that command them. I was also interested in the politics of this, so interviews with, for example, White House advisors and civilian service secretaries. Finally, the opposite side of the coin. What do insurgents think about this? What do news editors around the Middle East think about all of this? 
And then finally, um, the right and wrong and the legal and ethical questions of this. So interviews with military lawyers, but also people at groups like Human Rights Watch. And the book Wired for War gathers these stories together, but I think it also illustrates some of the dilemmas and questions that are emerging from this field. And so what I'd like to do today is briefly walk through what I see some of the key issues here. The first is to pull back in this important domain. When the U.S. force invaded Iraq in 2003, we had a handful of unmanned systems in the air. We now have over 7,000. On the ground, the invasion force had zero. We now have over 12,000 in the U.S. military inventory. But we need to remember that while these technologies often look like science fiction, they are only the first generation. They're the equivalent of the Model T-4 or the Wright Brothers Flyer. And the historic parallels that people make to where we are right now, I think, are quite instructive. Some scientists parallel where we are with unmanned systems to where we were with horseless carriages back in 1909 or 1910. Many in the military, particularly the Air Force, make the comparison to the airplane back in 1918. Others in commerce, for example, Bill Gates of Microsoft has said, were around where we were with computers back in 1980. Still others make the comparison to the atomic bomb in the late 1940s. The point here is that these are all issues, these are all technologies that had ripple effects on our world and everything from our politics to our laws to our commerce to our ethics. And these were all technologies that created deep questions for us in the area of the creation of law and oversight. And that's why I think it's very important for this committee that they're dealing with it. So what do I see as some of the key questions moving forward? The first is the question of where the unmanned military is headed. We've gone from barely using robotics to using thousands of them in a bureaucratic blink of an eye. But as one U.S. Air Force captain put it to me out in CENTCOM, the problem is, quote, it's not let's think this better, it's only give me more. So the sort of issues that we're wrestling with within this, issue, this bucket are questions like what are the proper doctrines that we should choose? What are the structures and organizations that we should build around these systems? How do we maintain competition and experimentation in an emerging sector in the defense industrial base? How do we ensure digital system security so that insurgents in Iraq can't access our information using $30 software that they bought off the internet? How do we better support the men and women who are operating them, who may not be in the physical war zone, but are experiencing an entirely new type of combat stress? And finally, what is the division of warrior and civilian in this space? That is, if this area is the future of the force, what does it mean that, for example, 75% of the maintenance of our predator fleet has been outsourced to private companies, while army systems operating in Iraq have been described as, quote, government-owned, contractor-operated? The second issue area that we have to wrestle with is are we engaged in three wars? Our unmanned systems have carried out 119 known airstrikes into Pakistan, which is about triple the number we did with manned bombers in the opening round of the Kosovo War. But Congress has not had a debate about it to authorize or disapprove of it. And so the question is, why do we not view it as a war? Is it because these strikes are being carried out by the CIA and not by the military? and thus not following the same lines of authority and authorization? Or is it because of the impact on the public is viewed as costless? And then related to this is the issue of what is the impact on the broader war of ideas? Not just how is it being interpreted here in the United States, but how is it being interpreted abroad? The next issue bucket is the question of law. Can our 20th century laws of war keep up with our 21st century technologies? Robotics don't remove the human from decision making, but they do move that human role geographically and chronologically. That is, decisions that determine a machine's action in the here and now may be made by an operator several thousand miles away or by a designer years ago. But the prevailing laws of war are from the 1940s. This also extends to the domestic side. It's not just an issue of accountability, but the question of regulation. It's not just the military that is using these systems, but, for example, the Department of Homeland Security. In turn, we've seen civilian border patrols or vigilante groups operating their own unmanned systems in the air. Criminals have started to use them to scout out targets. So as the FAA debates the opening up of the airspace, we also have broader issues of who can utilize these systems, which is a legal issue. But it also raises long-term questions that I remember discussing with a federal district court judge 
they believed it will reach the Supreme Court in terms of issues of probable cause and privacy. And the final question area that I would raise is how can we keep America from going the way of Commodore computers? If this is a growing industry along the lines of computers or automobiles, why does the United States not have a national robotics strategy? What does it mean for us moving forward that 43 other nations are also building, buying, and utilizing military robotics? How do we stay ahead in this game? And then we may even need to think more broadly about this. In what direction does the state of the American manufacturing economy, as well as the state of science and mathematics education in our schools, have us headed? Or another way of putting this is, what does it mean to deploy more and more soldiers, so to speak, whose hardware increasingly says made in China on the back of it, and whose software is increasingly written by someone sitting in a place like India? And I would end on this. These questions move us into lots of different directions, but I think within them that we find the policy answers. That is, we may debate the specifics of the answers, but almost all of them extend from a gap of some sort in our policy as the technology races ahead of our institutions. And so for that, I thank you for the opportunity to be part of this discussion today. Thank you. That gives us a lot to think about. Dr. Barrett. Mr. Chairman and subcommittee members, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Speaking as a civilian academic, I will first offer some reflections on these systems' ethical advantages and challenges, and then briefly discuss related educational initiatives at the Naval Academy. The goals animating the development and use of unmanned platforms are ethically commendable. While sometimes excoriated as merely prudential, effectiveness and efficiency are fundamentally moral imperatives. Constituted and supported by its citizen taxpayers, the liberal democratic state is morally obligated to effectively defend their human rights with their limited resources. Additionally, I would argue that unmanned systems are consistent with a society's duty to avoid unnecessary risks to its combatants, a duty that sparked the recent controversy over up-armored vehicles. But these rights and corresponding duties must be weighed against other ethical considerations. The venerable just war criteria that now undergird international law specify both pre-war and in-war imperatives. To be permissible, war must be the last resort available to a state intending to pursue a just cause, and circumstances must indicate a reasonable chance of succeeding in a proportionate manner. Once in war, harms must be necessary and proportionate. Vis-a-vis -vis uninvolved civilians who maintain their rights not to be harmed, soldiers incur additional risk to avoid foreseeable harm to innocents and assign greater weight to this harm. In this normative context, I will highlight four challenges generated by unmanned systems. First, they could encourage unjust wars. War cost reductions, of course, allow states to more readily pursue just causes. But favorable alterations to pre-war proportionality calculations could also reduce the rigor with which nonviolent alternatives are pursued and thus encourage unnecessary and therefore unjust wars. Additionally, in echoing concerns about private security firms and cyber attack capabilities, these less visible weapons could facilitate the circumvention of legitimate authority and pursuit of unjust causes. While these moral hazards do not require us to maximize war costs and minimize unmanned systems, they do require efforts to better inform and monitor national security decision makers. Second, once in war, remote controlled systems are said to induce unnecessary and disproportionate harm especially to civilians. The, the argument assumes that soldiers engaged in such virtual warfare are less situationally aware and also less restrained because of emotional detachment. However, accumulating data points in the opposite direction. Sensor improvements, lack of fear-induced haste, reduced anger levels and force protection anxieties, and crystal clarity about strike damage all combine to actually enhance awareness and restraint. If true, this data suggests that it would be unethical not to use remote controlled systems unless mitigating factors pertained. This qualification brings us to a third ethical considera consideration. Reasonable chance of success in counterinsurgency and stability operations mentioned earlier, where indigenous perceptions are crucial requires the judicious use of unmanned systems. Perceptions that these weapons are less discriminate or are indicative of flawed characters or tepid commitments can undermine our efforts unless accompanied by adjustments to footprints and perceptions themselves. 
Also, ground robots are incapable of developing necessary personal relationships with local citizens. Again, these arguments suggest the need for prudent, not unreflective limitations. But the use of autonomous strike systems, my fourth and final ethical consideration, requires more caution. Again, effectiveness and efficiency would be important benefits. Truly, robotic air, sea, and ground capabilities would sense, decide, and act more quickly than human beings. In an anti-access environment, a long-range system capable of independently navigating to, identifying, and striking mobile targets would bolster conventional extended deterrence. And the need to merely monitor, not control, these systems would reduce personnel costs. But exactly what would these autonomous systems sense, decide, and do? Would they adequately distinguish combatants from illegitimate targets, such as bystanding civilians and surrendering or injured soldiers? a task complicated by counter countermeasure requirements. Would they adequately, at least as well as humans, comply with necessity and proportionality imperatives? Discourage, discouraging these possible in bellow errors would require the elusive ability to credibly attribute bad results to a culprit. Designers, producers, acquisition personnel, commanders, users, and perhaps even robots themselves. And if the notion of robot responsibility ever becomes meaningful, would a self-conscious and willful machine choose its own ends and even be considered a person with rights? While robotic personhood is a titillating idea, near-term possibilities suggest a focus on the first few concerns. Computer scientist Ron Arkin is working assiduously to develop adequately discriminating and ethical robots with responsibility <laughs> attribution capabilities, and I would not bet against him. But even then, I would advise an incremental approach similar to that used with remote controlled systems, intelligence missions first, strike missions later. Given the complexity involved, I would also restrict initial strike missions to non-lethal weapons and combatant-only areas. Permission seeking and override features should also be included. One possible exception to this non-lethal recommendation would involve autonomous systems that target submarines systems which only would have to identify friendly combatants, enemy combatants, and perhaps whales. In closing, I want to assure the subcommittee that military educators are preparing military operators and staffers to think ethically about these and other emerging technologies. At the Naval Academy, the core ethics course taken by every second year midshipman covers these issues and their theoretical foundations. Last year, Mr. Singer delivered an endowed lecture to the entire second year class. The Department of Leadership, Ethics, and Law offers an, uh, an elective dedicated to emerging military technologies, including robotics. History and engineering courses that address these issues include history of technology, advanced topics in robotics, emerging technologies, and systems engineering. In April, 300 students in this last class will witness a debate between Ron Arkin and his less sanguine critic, Peter Asaro. And also in April, the Stockdale Center, for whom I work, the Academy's Ethics and Military Policy Think Tank will host a two-day conference on the ethical ramifications of emerging military technologies, attended by instructors from all U.S. service academies, staff colleges, and war colleges, and perhaps by a few congressional staffers who were invited. Mr. Chairman and subcommittee members, thank you for the opportunity to address these issues, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. At first, I thought you were going to have a great debate between yourself, you know, on the one hand, on the other hand, but you rounded it out pretty well at the end, and I appreciate that. I do. Now we have two professors that can uh, audition for uh, uh, talking to the entire sophomore class at the academy someday. <laughs> the opening rounds of it, but it is not military lawyers who've spent their years training on those situations. Doesn't mean they're making bad decisions, but that it's not their background like a JAG officer would have. The same, and that's on the authorization side. The same in terms of the planning side. You have political appointees and people with an intelligence specialty deciding aspects of an air war campaign. So that's a question of appropriateness. And there's a quote um, in my book uh, that connects to the seductive effect of it, and they describe how what we have playing out is like taking LBJ down to the foxhole. That is, civilians can make tactical level decisions now utilizing this technology. Doesn't mean that they should. Um, the second aspect of this is that Congress has not weighed in whether to support it or to go against it. And I think that is a question of legislative executive branch issues that we need to look at. And again, it's not a partisan issue. It's played out both before this administration and now during it. And um, the third is to the issue of effectiveness. 
there's a concern that while we may be taking out terrorist leaders, we may be sucking ourselves into a game of whack-a-mole, where we've been very successful at killing terrorist leaders, but are we also inadvertently aiding their recruiting? And um, I think the connection to the contractor issue here goes back to that question of appropriateness, the should of who should be involved. And it's not just a issue of legality. I think it's a long-term question of the future of the force. I remember meeting with an Air Force officer who pointed out a um, NCO who worked on maintenance. And they said, you know, they've served 12 years. How do we get to having a future NCO that's worked 12 years on these systems that brings that experience to bear, well, we've got to turn that over to them right now and wait 12 years. And that's not going to happen as we continue to outsource it. So if this is the future, we're setting ourselves up for a hollow capability. That would match some of our other capabilities that we've, we've um, referenced out work, sourced out work, uh, and that would be problematic, I think. Mr. Flake. Thank you. Dr. Barrett, you mentioned, uh, I think you said uh, that the evidence shows enhanced awareness and restraint. Uh, is, that, is that view shared uh, among the community? I'd like to see, Mother's Dr. Singer, do you, do you share that view that, uh, that unmanned uh, pilots uh, have uh, enhanced awareness and restraint? Do you want to? Well, it's, it's contested. I'll just put it okay. that way. Um, <clears throat> But there, there, there's this debate going on, and, and there is empirical data coming in from various sources. I can get you those sources that, that says exactly this, that especially because of these um, sensor improvements and all the other variables I mentioned, that uh, these, th there actually is more awareness and restraint. So uh, I think in uh, Dr. Singer's book, th this, you were a little bit more pessimistic about this issue. Um, it's a debate. I'll, I'll just uh, leave it okay. at that. I'm glad to hear that. I, I, I yeah. just wondered if that view is shared. Dr. Singer? I think we need to divide it into two parts. We do know about the military use of these systems, and I think they've shown um, exceptional respect for the laws of war. Uh, when you discuss this with people who are engaged in these operations, um, there's a series of checks and balances and consultation with military lawyers that they have to go through for authorizing and conducting a strike. The challenge is that the use on the intelligence side. Again, we don't even acknowledge that we've carried out these strikes, so I can't answer the mechanisms that they follow for that. Um, I will say one of the other issues is the wide array of perceptions about, for example, the civilian casualty concern. You have estimates that range from 2,000 civilian casualties on the high end to, I believe, the smallest I've seen reported is 20. When you backtrack the sources, it's interesting. The high-end ones often track back to regional media that is then receiving um, one, for example, was a Pakistani newspaper that was quoting um, someone from the ISI. The low end are quoting our own intelligence officials. My guess is the truth lies somewhere in between, but there's a broader concern here in terms of a war of ideas. It's not just the reality that matters. These perceptions have a power unto themselves. And so a challenge for us is how do we deal with that perception and show the painstaking way that we're going through and deal with the fact that it's coming out being viewed on the other side through a lens of anger. Thank you. Professor Anderson, how is this being played out, this, this, uh, this rise in, and these numbers are, are stark. Uh, we have 12,000 in inventory right now, is that I think Dr. Singer had mentioned that. How how is this being viewed in terms of the the the, the drones, the pilotless planes being flown between the the agencies and the the military? And I'd like the, the same uh, question asked by Dr. Jackson. Um, well, I, I think that the question at this point is partly the question of the perception in the region, as Dr. Singer has suggested. Uh, it's also a question of how it's seen in, you know, what we amorphously call the international community, um, uh, international actors such as academics and UN officials and tribunals and uh, all sorts of folks out there. And I think that there's a sense sometimes within the U.S. government across many administrations that none of this stuff really matters because it's just these soft law folks like me, right, I mean, uh, who can't really impact policy. 
But I think that if you look at the track of many different issues, starting with the landmines campaign for which I was primarily responsible in the early 1990s, uh, on through various parts of the war on terror debates, um, perceptions in the international community powerfully shape um, U.S. government responses in ways the U.S. government finds very hard to get in front of. And I think that here the divide comes probably initially between the military use of these things on overt battlefields where they look pretty much like any other standoff weapon with particular technological characteristics attached. And then the questions that are raised by the CIA use where it's not acknowledged, there's less data. Uh, and that those will actually be the sort of the fault lines that we will initially see in terms of the perception. Let me just follow up on that. I'm sorry, Dr. Jackson, I'll get back to you mm. later. But um, in your weekly standard piece, mm. uh, you talk about unqualified success that, uh, that uh, we, we've had in terms of the president, the vice president policy here. That, that, is that view um, shared by each branch of government? Does the intel community see it differently than the military, for example, uh, or is that? I'm not an insider to government, but I guess I would say that my perception from the outside is that there is concern within the Department of State, there is concern within some of the departments of government among the lawyers that uh, they've not settled on what their rationales are. And I believe that at some point that ill serves an administration which is embracing this. Now, maybe the answer is this is all really terrible and illegal and anybody that does it should go off to The Hague. Um, but if that's the case, then we should not be having the president say this is, you know, the greatest thing since whatever. Um, that seems like a bad idea. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Foster, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, for having uh, this uh, hearing on a very important subject. Um, uh, First, uh, to whoever wants and feels competent to field it, um, what's the approximate ratio of how much we spend on manned versus unmanned aircraft um, across our country, roughly? Does anyone want to? All right. I, the I'd next be, panel you, will be able to do that, I'm sure. What? Okay. Be, um, and are there um, under, understood and generally agreed upon advantages of having a man aboard a combat aircraft at this point for either the ground support or air superiority purposes? I mean, is there any consensus on, on any list of advantages? Well, a, a couple that come to mind. First, uh, there are no bandwidth limitations or vulnerabilities. So with the, uh, the unmanned remote controlled systems, you're working with a satellite and, and there's potential limitations on the amount of uh, bandwidth available and then also the vulnerability issue. So the, the, a mix of, say, air systems that are you know, manned and unmanned for that reason would be uh, called for. Um, also, there's some data that says that uh, doing combat air, air support, CAS missions, um, if you're getting on station, uh, the manned uh, platform it can get oriented more quickly. So for those types of missions, you might want a manned uh, platform in the area if you need a very quick response and orientation. Okay, and then for just general air superiority, is, it, is there any reason why drones won't essentially take over the business of well, I'd say that would just be a technical question. I don't think we're there yet, but it could happen at some point. Okay. And is, we're about to um, spend apparently a lot of money on a tanker system. Is that relevant for a future where drones are really the dominant force in, um, in um, air superiority? Or I think strike? among the designs for the uh, Navy UCAS, which is the uh, Delta Wing air sh airplane there, is a tanker version of it. If you're talking about carrier uh, operations in particular, you've got to provide for the refueling capability. There's no reason why that refueler could not also be an unmanned vehicle. So in the design work that's being done now, we're looking at that aircraft for combat and strike missions, but also as an air tanker version to refuel those unmanned systems. Okay, so, so the conclusion is it's not clear that the tanker we're talking about building um, really will fit in very nicely into a predominantly drone system. I, is, that, is that a reasonable conclusion or not? I, the yeah. designs of it, um, what, it's really not so much the tanker as opposed to the systems on the other side, the users of it. You want to make sure that they're interoperable with it. I think um, the overall strategic question that, that, that you're getting to is that we want to ensure that we're not making decisions right now that will 
paint us into a corner in the future. So for example, the acquisitions uh, part that you asked at the start, it's not so much the amount of money that we're spending on unmanned systems right now, but we are purchasing more of them physically than we are manned platforms. And so one of the challenges, um, one of the mistakes that uh, first movers have made in history, why they've fallen behind, is that they commit too early to one type, one model, and then 20 years out when we learn what is the best one, we're in a bad way. The British with the aircraft carrier would be an example here. So the issue I think for us is to ensure that we're continuing to experiment a great deal and then also making sure that we're not locking ourselves into one design or future, which to me means we need to focus on our acquisition system and make sure that we don't have uh, oligopolies emerge or monopolies. Is there just a, a, a working number for the, the cost ratio between a manned and an unmanned uh, aircraft with comparable capabilities? Is it order of a factor of 10 or a factor of 100? Closer to 10, I think. Okay. Yeah. Can I add so one? What I'm worried about is we're going to at some point be asked to defend Taiwan um, you know, with a, tank, with a, a you know, set of aircraft carriers, and we're going to all of a sudden 10,000 Chinese manufactured mass produced mm -hmm. drones will be coming at us, and it'll be game over. Yeah. Um, are, are th those sort of things routinely get gamed out, um, sort of equal dollar value drone versus, um, un versus manned aircraft? Um, fleets. So that trade off is routinely looked at at this point? They're starting to be, um, at least within the media reports of war gaming to that effect. The real issue is one of quantity versus quality moving forward. And I think this is an issue for our overall acquisition system. That is, do we want the capability to deploy a large number? Or will the high cost of systems lock us into only being able to buy a very few gold-plated versions? And a concern I have when I um, look at the models moving forward is that we are starting to make decisions right now that will lead to some of the similar things we've seen play out with the Joint Strike Fighter or DDX or FCS, where we don't exactly know the future, but we know that the system that is too big to fail uh, and is so costly that we can only buy a couple of them, paints ourselves into a corner in a scenario with, for example, a China or the like, where the amount that we can buy should not decide the tactics and the strategy that we take in war. But that's the future that we are headed with, including in unmanned systems. Thank you. Could, could I add one, one comment on sure, the man? Uh, another reason why you'd want man is because it, it keep, keeps the homeland less involved. Uh, if you're fighting a war with only unmanned systems, uh, there's no one for the enemy to shoot at. Uh, th there's no option for even guerrilla war. Uh, therefore, you're inviting, I think, terrorism in, in the homeland. So I think for, for that third reason, you would, you would want to mix. You don't want to go to just unmanned, otherwise they're, you're, they're coming here. And Mr. Foster, I might add that the, uh, the Naval War College has done a lot of work in terms of the potential future for integrating unmanned systems into the maritime environment. The Chief Naval Operations task in 2008, its Strategic Studies Group, to look at how you would use these systems. So there was a year spent in study of how you would integrate these systems, where you would use manned, where you would use unmanned systems. And uh, some very fine work was done and brought out some, uh, some notions of it's got to be a balance between the two, but the, the unmanned provides you some unique capabilities in terms of endurance, in terms of ability to deploy from the continental United States and use these systems and whatnot. So there has been a fair amount of work done in that. Not a lot of games per se, but a lot of, uh, of discussion and thinking about how they'd be employed. Mr. Fagan, ma'am, please, please be quiet and please sit down. I told you before at the beginning of this hearing, we are having... You're going to have an opportunity to sit down now or be asked to leave. It's your choice, ma'am. Would you care to sit down and listen like the rest of us are and trying to learn something here? Would you like to be asked to leave? Well, think about it. Asked to leave. Thank you. We're going to give our guest, officer, we'll give our guest one more chance. But if it speaks out again, we'll have to ask to be removed. Mr. Fagan, uh, what I was going to ask is, you know, obviously there are so many other uses that are non-military of this kind of technology. And, and I can think of some of my own district, which is heavily reliant on uh, the fishing industry and some of the underground techno underwater technology that could really identify um, for purposes of determining catch shares or uh, what fish are overfish, which ones aren't, uh, to other land uses, things of that nature. And when you start talking about that, 
Uh, the real question becomes, how do we keep the innovation going uh, internationally, not just in our country or whatever? At the same time, obviously, it would be ideal to deprive other countries that might uh, wish us harm from getting the technology that could do so in this category. Can you possibly do that? or, um, Mr. Chairman, I, I believe it's possible. Uh, commercial market is going to drive requirements for technology. If there's a, if there's a commercial demand for fishing and uh, surveillance related to fishing, I think that uh, sensor systems and technologies will be developed to support that. Uh, currently, there needs to be some regulations that would support the operation of aircraft to, in support of that industry. And I'm pretty confident that technology, uh, I'm not uh, well versed in exactly how uh, shoals of fish are, uh, are spotted, but let's assume that it's done optically with optical sensors. Uh, there exist quite high, high quality optical sensors that I would imagine could be adopted for that. But we'll need, as I said, two things, a requirement and permission to actually fly the systems in support of those. So the, the technology is cross-cutting. As, uh, as, as the market increases, uh, the, the demand for these uh, higher quality sensors will increase and the cost will go down and the technology will improve. I, I hope that answered your question. Well, it does a little bit. I may not have asked it as clearly as I could have, but there comes a point in time where some people are going to say, look, we can't allow some of this technology to be exported. We can't allow even some of this uh, equipment to be exported because we're afraid others will put them to a, a devious use on that. Uh, is it even possible to, uh, to that, draw that kind of a line, or uh, is it it's going to happen anyway? That's, that's a difficult line, and I'm, yeah. I'm not an expert in export control regulations. I know that our manufacturers have voiced their, their concern that sometimes they're, they're too complicated and difficult to comply with. But uh, yes, I think it is possible that if export controls aren't administered properly, it could uh, end up uh, providing bad people with uh, highly technical systems that could be used against the United States. So we're not... Uh, AVSI and, and, and me personally, I'm not uh, opposed to export regulations. It's just uh, we'd like to see them uh, easy to use and uh, administered in a, in a, in a uh, expedited way. Let me just ask the, the survey of the rest of the panel just quickly on that. Does anybody think that there's a possibility of uh, controlling the export uh, of this technology in such a way that it would not be uh, something we'd have to be concerned about other countries using against our interest, or is that just something that can't be done? Dr. Singer? No, it's, it'd be like trying to control computers um, or trying to control automobiles. We already see 43 other countries building, buying, and using these systems and a range of non-state actors for both positive and nefarious purposes. I think the bigger question is how do we maintain our competitiveness in this field? How do we ensure that um, businesses can continue to thrive so that we can innovate? And I think a long-term issue here is ensuring that they have a pipeline of young scientists, young engineers who can succeed. Uh, and um, that speaks to the challenges of having a national robotics strategy that connects to broader science and technology, engineering, mathematics issues. Thank you. Professor Jackson, you agree? Just as a point of interest, sir, the, uh, the Scan Eagle, which was used to support the rescue of Captain Phillips in the Marisk, Alabama situation, was originally developed for the tuna industry and it was launched from tuna ships to go out to find where the sh fish were located and then they would recover it from the uh, from the air and so that was civilian technology that's been adapted we now have over 200,000 hours of uh, of time used in military applications for surveillance purposes so it's certainly a two-way street thank you I, I see the others nodding so i won't bother the, the question on that uh, an agreement but so what are the prospects does anybody want to uh, offer here for an international treaty that addresses um, the use of these uh, to restrict the military or other uh, uses of that in any particular circumstances? Is anybody aware of any uh, negotiations or discussions are, uh, that have been started anywhere about this topic? Professor Anderson? Uh, probably the closest to this would be the development uh, by different bodies such as the International Committee of the Red Cross or several of the scholarly bodies that um, uh, put out model codes for the laws of war. Uh, there has been recent re recently released um, a model air war manual that would address part of these things and it specifically has measures talking about unmanned vehicles uh, both in a surveillance capacity as well as a weapons firing capacity. Uh, the U.S. has participated through the Department of Defense in numbers of those discussions, and I'd say that in the case of the Air War Manual, I would describe without 
attributing it uh, without speaking for the Department of Defense, I would describe it that the U.S. Uh, DOD has participated very actively in the formulation of the specific black letter rules that have been developed, but I think was actually quite stunned by the commentary manual that was developed by several of the experts that would go along with that and would attempt to provide sort of authoritative guidance. The U.S. does, I do not think, will wind up regarding that as authoritative. The second is also a technical issue in some sense. It's the um, IC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, development of what it calls interpretive guidance on direct participation in hostilities, which goes to the question of civilians who may be taking part in ways that Dr. Singer referenced, or CIA personnel, or terrorists themselves that may not be regarded, strictly speaking, as combatants, but nonetheless lawful targets. Uh, again, the U.S. had a number of experts who participated in that process, um, and the ICRC has put that out as, as guidance. Uh, however, that has been extremely controversial in parts of its formulations, um, essentially in saying that you can have part-time uh, participants in hostilities who may not be targeted between activities that they're carrying out. And the U.S., I do not think, will come close to signing on to those. Thank you. Mr. Flake. Dr. Singer, you mentioned that uh, there are some use, criminal uses, uh, and it's been mentioned for nefarious purposes, you put it. Can you uh, give some examples of uh, non-state actors or others that are uh, using it in this way? <coughs> The examples range from one that was mentioned of uh, Hezbollah during its war with Israel operating these systems to um, some of the border militia groups utilizing them to there were a group of uh, thieves in Taiwan a couple weeks ago who used robotic helicopters to scout out targets and ensure that they were ready to steal from. Um, what we're seeing here, again, this technology is what you could describe as the parallel to open source software. It's not like an aircraft carrier, it's not like an atomic bomb where you need a huge industrial structure not only to build it, but to utilize it. And so that means that we have a flattening effect playing out in terms of who can utilize this technology. And um, the positive side is, again, the range of uses that can be made, everything from fishery to environmental monitoring. Um, to uh, we used a global hawk to, uh, for um, response to the humanitarian disaster in Haiti. But the opposite is that it lowers the bar for nefarious actors. The best illustration I can give of that, of the potential, is um, during World War II, Hitler's Luftwaffe, Hitler's Air Force, could not strike the United States. It didn't have that reach. A couple years ago, a 77-year-old blind man designed his own unmanned system that flew across the Atlantic. And so the, what we have to, in a sense, do is, um, in my mind, the 9-11 Commission described that part of the cause of the tragedy on that day was a failure of our own imagination. We need to apply this to this emerging technology here as well, imagination and how we can utilize it for positive ends, but also being aware of the threat scenarios are widening as well. Thank you. Um, Professor Anderson, uh, a UN official uh, raised a prospect drone attacks are a form of extrajudicial execution, I think is the way it was put. Um, have any organs of the United Nations, or you spoke of it a little in your last uh, um, colloquy, but uh, are, are we likely to see these challenges from international organizations or, or states themselves? Uh, where, where do you think the challenges are likely to come in from, whether it's the Red Cross just looking for guidelines or or uh, is it likely the UN that uh, through its agencies that are going to demand some kind of guidelines here? Well, I think that this is gradually a developing campaign in which there are various international actors who are very unhappy with the development of this, both the technology and at this moment by its use in particular by civilian uh, agencies. And I think that their difficulties with the technology range all the way back to military use on the active battlefield. But the easy place to sort of move in a campaign to peel that off is, uh, is with the CIA. And in that regard, then, the charge has been leveled that this is a violation of international human rights standards. It constitutes extrajudicial execution without having any charges, without having attempted to arrest the person, 
We respond by saying the person is a terrorist combatant and can be targeted at any point. We're not obligated to try and detain them or to capture them. Um, but there are many, many authorities out there who disagree vehemently with that. And one of the questions that will arise is the United States has never across many, many decades agreed to sign on to the extraterritorial application of the treaties that would make it possible to characterize these acts as being extrajudicial execution. It has never agreed to that. And one of the questions will be whether the administration, without really sort of thinking about its impacts on these kinds of areas that are close to its heart, winds up weakening um, those uh, uh, restraints or winds up weakening the U.S. opposition to that without really taking into account the effect that it would have on precisely these kinds of things. The long-term effect of that, given that there are not necessarily statutes of limitations in these kinds of acts, could be the problem of CIA officers or, for that matter, military officers uh, or their lawyers being called up in front of international tribunals or courts of Spain or someplace and said, you've engaged in extrajudicial execution or simple murder and we're going to investigate and indict. Thank you. Mr. Foster. Yes, um, Dr. Singer. Um, you mentioned a couple of times a national robotics strategy or in STEM education as being crucial to um, keeping our lead in this area, if such a lead exists. And um, there are a number of things like the U.S. first robotics um, competitions. There's the Fab Lab where they have rapid prototype me equipment that are distributed. Do you have any favorites here or uh, ideas of what the best strategy um, is going to be going forward, you know, besides just dumping a bunch of money into it? <laughs> I, I'm not going to pick favorites in terms of competitions, but I think there is, it's interesting that a number of the other uh, states that are um, succeeding and thriving in this realm, like, for example, South Korea, do have these sorts of strategies, and it'd be interesting for us to learn from them. I think you mentioned some of the aspects of what a strategy might look like. Some of the elements of it include, for example, um, not just the sort of uh, we have these isolated islands of excellence in terms of robotics labs or robotics competitions. How can we expand upon those so that you're engaging um, youth in a greater way, but also that you're allowing, allowing the best design to win? Um, can we um, support greater gr graduate scholarships in this realm? Is there the possibility of uh, creating public-private partnerships along the lines of um, special geographic zones, the way what we've seen with a research triangle in North Carolina or a Silicon Valley? Is there the potential of something like that in robotics? But again, part of this should also be having it go hand in hand with discussions about the impact of what they're doing in the lab on the world beyond the kind of ethics discussions that the professors here are leading. Um, and I think that element has been missing as well to a prior question that was asked of debates about um, regulation. We have the start within the robotics field of whether roboticists, what kind of research should they engage on, what should they not, should there be arms control, sort of the early nodes of the landmines treaty when it comes to the issue of autonomy moving forward. But for example, if you were a young roboticist, you don't have a code of ethics right now to turn to the way if you were a young medical scientist. And I think that's part of this strategy has to be not only what do we do to maintain national competitiveness, but also how do we wrestle with the issues beyond. Okay. And, uh, Professor Anderson or anyone who wants to feel it, um, is there a moral, legal, or political distinction between a decapitation strike and just a strike against the normal military hierarchy that you see? Um, you know, when you're deliberately going after the political leadership of an organization compared to just the, the, the chain of command? If one is talking about a non-state actor group which has been characterized with legal reasons uh, as being a terrorist group, then there's not really going to be a distinction between, I mean, they are targets in that sense. Um, there are other kinds of legal issues that arise if one goes after a purely decapitation strategy with regards to um, a regime. Um, it again is lawful in my view, um, but the legal rationales are different because it's a state versus a non-state. And so the legal questions that arise here about going after leadership targets uh, in, in terrorist organizations, uh, in part they are the kinds of strategic and prudential arguments that Dr. Singer has raised about, you know, sort of whack-a-mole questions and those things. Um, 
But I don't think that there is legal questions about the question of the lawfulness of targeting uh, the people that are involved. Yeah. Another, another thing that I'm sure occurs to everyone is whether we're in danger of gradually lowering the threshold for a declared war. You know, during the Cold War, there were all these games of chicken played over the Arctic continuously. And if we had drones, we just perhaps would have escalated that into actually, um, you know, destroying hardware. And so when the hardware becomes, you know, nuclear-capable hardware, you're talking about a really scary line that, that is in danger of being crossed. And I was just wondering, um, you know, what the thinking is in terms of, you know, is it possible to, to implement a, a hard line that says this is an act of war and this is not an act of war when there are unmanned vehicles only in the, in, in the battle? The way I visualize this is that the, both the barriers to war are dropping both socially, politically, but also now technologically, but at the same time our definition of war is changing. And um, we can see this in terms of, you know, set aside from robotics, we haven't, this body hasn't declared war since 1941. Um, we don't have a draft or conscription anymore. We don't pay war bonds or higher taxes for war. And now we have a technology that allows us to carry out what we would have previously termed acts of war mm -hmm. without having to have a political debate about it. I mean, literally, it's not a theoretic issue. We have carried out at least 119 airstrikes, and this body hasn't had a debate about it, either to support or to go against. And so the way I see it, again, was that the barriers to war were already lowering. The technology perhaps allows these barriers to hit the ground. And that, um, what was interesting is that when I went around interviewing people, that was a concern that was shared both within, for example, I remember an interview with someone at Human Rights Watch who raised that, but also an interview with a special operations officer within the U.S. military as one of their big concerns here. If I could just add to that, I think the, if, if the administration's lawyers were here in front of you today, they would say that this is all covered by the AUMF insofar as we're targeting people who are in some way connected either with al-Qaeda or with the authors of 9-11, and that that's true whether or not one is talking about the strikes in Pakistan or even the strikes in Yemen or any other place. Um, I believe that where this question that you raise becomes most important is that not all the enemies that the United States will face in the decades into the future are going to turn out to be al-Qaeda, nor will they be connected to 9-11, and that the question that this body, the Congress, has to address is as the thresholds that Dr. Singer describes gets lowered, then the question of the controls on the use of force will depend on, first of all, whether you assign those functions directly to the military and to no other force or allow the CIA and covert operations to, to partake of that, which I believe is hugely important for avoiding overt wars. There is a reason why it is that the CIA has been tasked in Pakistan to do what it does rather than having the undeniable presence of the U.S. military there. I think that's the right decision. But as this moves into the future, the lines drawn with respect to the CIA have to be drawn. And I believe that as the threshold for what constitutes the use of force is lowered, the responsibility of this body will not lie in issuing things like more AUMFs unless there is another 9-11 or something similar, but will lie in the way in which this body exercises its oversight functions and strengthens its oversight functions to require much greater reporting, much more detailed reporting. But at the same time, the concomitant part of that is this body is going to have to be learned to be a whole lot more uh, effective at keeping the secrets that are involved. And I, uh, I just want to let you know that we, you have our gratitude for that. Uh, we may at some time want to call you back, either for a formal hearing or just for a discussion uh, to educate us more on the issue. We're going to go for about a half hour, and we, we'll come back, probably less than a half hour now, for 20 minutes or so, come back with our second panel. Again, thank all of you on this panel. We'll take a recess now. Sir. Thank you. Oh. Nicely done. Thank you. You too. That was uh... tough issue.